in my lecture today, I want to uh, certainly uh, introduce you to a technique uh, which is becoming more and more important as uh, we're moving into smaller and smaller structures in many technological areas. Uh, nanotechnology is obviously a very important, very well-known uh, word and if we really tailor nanostructures to influence the properties of our material we need analytical tools which can image the devices and the structures on the same level and preferably on the atomic level and uh, the atomic level is certainly something which we can reach now with our analytical techniques and uh, with uh, all the high resolution imaging which we can do so actually uh, in the course of my lecture I will take you a little bit through the basic of TEM. I understand that uh, there are many, I hope there are many students listening as well. So I also want to give you a kind of a, a very elementary overview of uh, electron microscopy and what we can do. But then in the second uh, part of my lecture, I also want to cover uh, some very modern uh, material science applications of our technique and uh, so I hope that uh, for each of you, there is uh, something uh, new and something interesting involved. So as you may remember, the first electron microscope was built in Berlin in the year 19, finished in the year 1932 by Knoll and Ruska. And uh, Ruska actually had to wait for 54 years, I think, before he got the Nobel Prize in 1986 and uh, Knoll obviously would have got the Nobel Prize as well but uh, he was dead at that time and Nobel Prizes are only given to living people so Ruska received the Nobel Prize and in the end uh, he was also our namesake he gave uh, we were able to use his name for our Ans Ruska Center which I'm co-directing at Uli and uh, which I will also introduce to you on the capabilities which we have there. But uh, uh, let me first start uh, on the student level and let me uh, discuss some basic arguments about uh, electron microscopy, why we need electron microscope, what is uh, the background of electron microscopy. And let me start with these, this very simple slide where we uh, compare the resolution limits of optical instruments, resolution limits, if we talk about uh, uh, small details uh, in matter, yeah? And you're all familiar with these length scales, uh, millimeter, micrometer, nanometer. Uh, I hope you're familiar with the length scale angstrom because angstrom is the world in which we live. Angstrom is actually the world uh, in which the atoms live. So one angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters and um, these are basically the dimensions in the atomic world. So if you think about the atomic structure, you can think about uh, the atoms as hard spheres, as balls which touch each other. And then the average distance between two atoms is of the order of maybe one and a half to two and a half angstrom. This holds for almost any material. And then it's just easier to say angstrom rather than 0.2 nanometers or 0.1. 1.5 nanometers and so on. So angstrom is our basic unique in which the atomic world lives. And then here even the picometer 10 to the minus 12 meter and you will see why uh, it is there. So if we talk about uh, resolution limits of optical instruments, the first question which uh, you can ask yourself is actually what is the resolution of the human eye if we look at microscopic details? And actually, you can uh, uh, give the answer yourself uh, quite easily. And uh, that's why I put here uh, the human hair. A human hair has a diameter of, uh, let's say, 50 to 60 micrometers. And you know that uh, basically the human hair, let me take this pencil, if this were human hair, you can see the human hair as a single line, but you could not resolve two points perpendicular to, to the line. So resolution 60 micrometer let's say if you have good eyes maybe 100 micrometer more average value now in order to see more detail of the hair or in matter you need microscopes and uh, the first uh, and most uh, well developed or most uh, well this 
distributed microscope is a light microscope. And actually with the light microscope, you can easily see it basically needs two basic things to build a microscope. The first thing is a radiation, which we use for imaging. And the second thing we need is lenses. And these two together uh, uh, are the most substantial ingredients of a microscope and also determine the resolution. Yeah, now, you know, for a light microscope, the lenses which we use, the glass lenses, are so perfect that the wavelength of the visible light uh, determines the resolution. Actually, wavelengths of the light, 400 to 700 nanometer. So maybe a resolution, average light microscope, about half a micrometer, very expensive tools, maybe a little bit uh, less. Yeah. So half a micrometer, this tells you that where you see the hair as a single line, you can resolve 100 points perpendicular to the hair with a light microscope. But this resolution is certainly not sufficient to resolve smaller details in matter. Knoll and Ruska actually had the main aim to resolve structures in biological materials. We are more looking at the inorganic world and from transistors down to atoms, we want to understand the nature of our objects. So we need a, a radiation with a shorter wavelength. If you start from light, you could go to, X, uh, to ultraviolet and then to X-rays. But then you have the problem that you miss the second part, you miss the lenses. At least when Knoll and Ruska built the first electron microscope, it was a general paradigm that there are no lenses for ultraviolet and X-rays. And that's because of the refractive index of matter, which gets closer and closer to one as we go to shorter wavelengths and then we cannot build lenses anymore. So if, if um, light and photons do not do the job, then the next choice is particle. And people knew at that time as well that actually if you accelerate particles very rapidly, they behave like a wave. And the most simple particle is an electron. So why shouldn't we try, and this was the idea of Knoll and Ruska, to use electrons to build a microscope. Now, uh, yeah, here's the light microscope. The big uh, advantage of electrons is that they have a very short wavelength. And that's why we have the picometers here so we have a wavelength in the picometer range. But now we have the other problem, we need lenses. This was basically where Knoll and Ruska had their big success. They developed a system of lenses for an electron microscope and they built the first electron TEM, which has a little bit better, just a little bit better resolution than a light microscope. But nowadays we can go much deeper. But now we have the problem, the wavelength is very short, but the lenses we have to build, they're actually very poor lenses. And so we have a, a, a wavelength in the picometer range, but because we have so poor lenses, we lose about a factor of 100 in resolution. But the big advantage is if we start with picometer, if you lose a factor of 100, you're still in the angstrom range. So we can hope to uh, be able to resolve even the smallest detail in nature, which are the atoms. So, as I said, uh, between the light microscope and the human eye, there is a factor of 100. And between the wavelengths of the electron microscope and its final resolution, there is also a factor of 100. So a TEM is about as poor for microscopic uh, details as the human eye compared to a highly specialized light microscope, okay? But I will show you how we can also improve this situation. That's, this will be part of my talk. But again, uh, if we talk about students, let's have a quick look inside the optics of a microscope and inside obviously the optics of an electron microscope, TEM. But let's start with a light microscope. This is a very simple comparison, which I normally show to school classes, but it has some physical background as well. And the physical background comes from the fact that if we describe such a light microscope, such an optical microscope in geometrical optics, then we have exactly the same description as if we describe a TEM, a transmission electron microscope. And uh, so let's use this comparison and let's compare a light microscope with a TEM. Now, obviously, we always have the electron source at the top, so you have to turn this upside down. And rather than a light uh, source, we have an electron source. Then in the 
geometrical optics, we have an illumination system. So in this case, the electron beam is guided to the specimen. Here is the specimen. We always use thin specimen in transmission, like a transmission light microscope, but in this case, electron microscope. And then we use an imaging system to produce a magnified image. So in geometrical optics, it's exactly the same uh, uh, how we build an electron microscope. Now the question is, uh, uh, we know how to build a light beam. How do we form an electron source? How do we form lenses? So let me go step by step with some schematic drawings uh, through such a microscope to give you an impression of what's inside the TM, what is the interior. And uh, let's start to, at the top with the electron source. So we need an electron beam. Uh, we call this a cathode. Uh, this emits the electrons in the simplest case uh, because we heat it up to very high temperatures two and a half thousand, three thousand degrees, then electrons are emitted by this uh, metallic wire, for example, a tungsten wire. We focus this electron beam with the help of another electrode, we call this the venal cathode. Uh, we bring all the electrons to this crossover spot and then we accelerate them with the high voltage in our electron microscope. So we apply for the instruments, which I will show you, 200,000 or 300,000 volts, uh, 200 and 300 kilovolt. Uh, now we have an electron beam. Uh, this lower electrode is called the anode. Here we have a, di a hole with a diameter of about, let's say, one millimeter. And this is where the electron beam enters the electron optical column of our instrument. Now, to build the electron optical column, first we need an illumination system, which guides the electrons to the sample. In this illumination system, we need lenses. And now the question is, how can we build lenses for electrons? And this was answered by Knoll and Ruska. They first started with an electric field. Nowadays, we lose lenses which use an, a magnetic field. Now, why do we need fields, electric or magnetic? In order to understand this, uh, you have to compare light. Light is photons. Photons have no mass and no charge. Here we use electrons. And since they have a mass in the charge, they have a very strong interaction with matter. And this means we actually cannot use like glass lenses or any lenses made out of a material because the electrons would immediately get stuck. Actually, the only time when the electrons see matter in our transmission electron microscope is when they pass through the sample. That's the very only time. But we can show, and again, uh, I don't want to go so deep, that uh, if we build a magnetic field, this is a coil through which we pass an electric current, and this builds a field with the field lines like this. And these field lines, this magnetic field, the red field lines, act on our green electron beam exactly like if there were a glass lens, or let's say a parallel beam, we focus to a point. Now uh, we have the lenses. Now we look at the first at the top half of our electron microscope. That's the illumination system. So this brings us from the electron source to the specimen. And you see a number of three to four lenses uh, which guide the beam through the specimen. Actually, in this case, uh, the, what, what the lenses do is they simply make the diameter of the electron beam smaller. So here we have a hole where let's say a millimeter in diameter. On the specimen, we want to illuminate maybe one micrometer, maybe only one nanometer. So we demagnify uh, the waste of the electron beam. We have deflectors where we can guide the beam to specific positions. And so in, in this case, the lenses are actually used in a demagnifying uh, mode. Uh, then the electrons pass through the sample because of this strong interaction. Remember, electrons have a mass and a charge. Also, the samples have to be very thin. So the samples which we look at typically have a thickness of maybe 50 nanometer, maybe only 10 nanometer in very special cases. So the electrons go through the sample, and then uh, we want to magnify the image of the sample. So now we look below the sample where we have the imaging system. 
And now you see the sample on the top and you see the first lens, like in any optical system, we actually call the objective lens. And then we have four more lenses and then we see a magnified image. And this is actually projected on a viewing screen or we can also use digital cameras. So the images, which I will show you, they were all acquired with a digital camera. So in a light microscope, you know, you can reach a magnification of maybe 1000 times. Here you actually, we go up a primary magnification to the screen of maybe 1 million times. So the objective lens is a very special lens. So we have a magnification of about a hundred times. Each one of these lenses makes a further magnification of about 10 times. So if we multiply everything together, you get about 1 million times to the screen. And that's basically all you know about the basic design of an electron microscope. And I thought I should show this in the beginning so that you get uh, an impression of the background of our techniques. This is actually one instrument which has been cut open by my colleagues at the Technion at Haifa. It's a very old instrument, so you see you still analog uh, controls. But the basic uh, functions inside don't look different from a modern microscope. So here we have the electron source, here we have the anode. This is where we accelerate, here we apply the high voltage. And then you see these copper things. This is really the, the, the coils which have been cut. So millions and millions of windings of uh, copper, uh, 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 copper wire uh, so that we get the magnetic field. So these are the lenses. Uh, here you can see the sample holder. The sample, the thin sample is in the center. And then you can see these magnified lenses, magnifying lenses which project the image on the viewing screen. You can watch it through binoculars or you can use a digital camera to record the image. So that's a very old instrument. That's one of our new instrument, which we have at Aachen. So at Aachen, we have this conventional type of microscope as we call it, 200 kilovolt acceleration voltage. And we cannot see the finest details of atoms, but we can look at very important structures uh, in matter. So, I mean, just uh, let me show you one example. Um, here, I, I, I showed you in this original graph that uh, transistors are something which are interesting for technology, but which are far too small uh, to be imaged in a light microscope. So here is now a, a, a transistor, uh, which we were able to characterize with our TEM. Actually at the time, it's a couple of years ago, when we did this characterization, this was the smallest transistor which had ever been manufactured in Europe, smallest transistor. Yeah? Obviously, they want to see what's inside the transistor, how small are the dimensions. So this is a top view with an SEM. Then we use a focused ion beam instrument. So we cut a very thin sample with a gallium ion beam. And then we look at the core of the transistor in the TEM. So here is the core of the transistor. We zoom in. And we see the internal structure of this transistor. Let me just give you a brief idea of what you can learn uh, with such a technique on, on such an uh, instrument. So what does the transistor uh, consist of? This is a field effect transistor, metal oxide, MOS, field effect transistor. So in, in principle, we have a current which flows here and which we control by a gate. Now, actually, it's much easier to understand the function of such a transistor if we look at the distribution of the chemical elements. So now we do a mapping of the chemical elements and silicon obviously is the most important element. So all the structures which conduct the current and which uh, switch the current, switch the transistor are made of silicon. But then we have to insulate this structure. So we need actually an oxide, silicon dioxide in this case, so we're on an insulating substrate. And here you see insulating layers between the channel, which conducts the current and the gate. And we can actually combine this in two different colors. And now you can even, you know, in, in this image, real image of a transistor, it's very simple to understand the operation actually. So in an FET transistor, you have a source drain connection, source drain, and that's what they call the channel where the current flows. And then you have a gate and the function of the gate obviously is to switch the channel open or to close it. 
So the gate must be insulated so that you can apply a potential. And obviously now if you apply a positive potential, if the electron, the current is formed by electrons, then the electron can flow this way. If you apply a negative potential, then the electrons are stopped. Uh, now uh, the dimensions, the typical dimensions of a transistor are the gate widths. And here you can see this, we measured this and it's 12.5 nanometer. And this gives us an impression, uh, gives you an impression how small this transistor is. And as I said, this was European record when we measured it. Yeah? Now you can ask yourself, this is now, if you make this smaller and smaller, the volume gets small. So actually you put the gate in a vertical direction. We call this a vertical gate. Okay. Now you can ask yourself, this small, tiny little gate, how can this switch a current which is in such a wide or high channel? And the answer is it cannot. So you use, they use, developed a special trick. And this is, they applied this second electrode, which they call an upper gate. So to the second electrode, you just apply a positive potential. And this positive potential pulls the electron all the way to this interface with the oxide. So electrons can only flow here, but not lower in the channel. And then you can see now this gate can control the current. And so just as an example, this is a first material science application, very important for lithography and for co computer technology of our techniques. But obviously we want to get better. We want to have better resolution. We want to see the atomic structure. So this is just one example. Let's say we have two materials, we have an interface. We want to understand the interface on the atomic dimensions. And uh, the question is, how can we get a resolution which is good enough? Um, and what limits the resolution at TM? I said the resolution which we have compared to the wavelengths, we lose about a factor of 100. And with this factor of 100, it's very difficult to see the atomic structure. We can still do uh, quite a few things um, with, uh, with these high resolution TEM. So let me show you just a size comparison of what we want to see in detail. And uh, let me start again this comparison with the human hair. Yeah? Remember what I told you, you s with the human eye, you just see a single line, dark line, bright line, whatever. You just see this as a single line. Diameter 60 micrometers. So I told you that our TEMs can provide a magnification of about 1 million times. So 60 micrometers times 1 million, you get 60 meter. You get the width of a soccer field. Actually, that's the size of a hair at this magnification. Now on this soccer field, basically, we can see atomic details in nature. So this is just the first very simple example. Here we have a gold nanoparticle, a diameter of two nanometer. This is already the high resolution image which we see. But let's see if we start in reality with something which has a diameter of two nanometer. We multiply this by one million time and we get two millimeters, right? Two nanometers times one million, two millimeters. Two millimeters is the width of a leaf of grass on this soccer field. So that's the width of the image. It's like a leaf of grass. And on this leaf of grass, uh, we basically see the image of this gold nanoparticle. And we actually have a resolution with the top systems, which I will show you. We have a resolution that we can see details of about half an angstrom, 0.6 of an angstrom. So if on this leaf of grass, we have a real hair, yeah, on this leaf of grass, we could still resolve it. So that's the resolving power, yeah. Uh, magnification such that uh, the hair is as wide as a soccer field, but if there would be a real hair on this soccer field, we could still see it with our electrons. This is the power of this high magnification of the resolution. This is also a problem, and I will address this later on. This is a problem when we want to do material science. Because what does it help us if we know the structure of one leaf of grass uh, to understand the purposes of the whole soccer field. Maybe there is no grass or maybe there's only grass in one corner and we just uh, missed uh, the rest of the information. So how can we bridge the length scales is actually also a very important question. And I will come back to this. You see here in gold, for example, just as a first indication again, how we can understand uh, 
the properties of matter. A gold, as you know, has an FCC, uh, face centered cubic crystal structure. But here you can see that we actually have five defects in these gold nanoparticles. These are actually twins, so we mirror the structure of the gold across these twin boundaries. So for the structure, they are like mirror points. So why have we a fivefold twins? And what we can learn from these images, actually, and which is well known, if we start with an initial cluster of gold atom, this actually has icosahedral symmetry. So icosahedral symmetry means in this projection, we have fivefold symmetry. Now, if this starts to grow, then actually nature wants to preserve this fivefold symmetry, but switch to FCC crystal structure. And the most easiest way is to introduce these five twin boundaries. So here you can also see if we look at the atomic nature of our materials, obviously it's a three-dimensional object. So in the image, we see a projection in two dimensions, okay? And this means that maybe at the borders of the particle, we see single gold atoms, but in the center, we have a thickness maybe of two nanometers as well. Average distance of the atoms is maybe two angstrom. So in each of these bright dots, we actually see an atomic column in projection and maybe have uh, 10 atoms in the center, maybe five atoms out here. So this gives you an impression of the dimensions which we want to understand if we look at the atomic structures. Now the question is, what limits our resolution? Yeah, I told you we lose a factor of 100 uh, compared to the wavelengths. So our magnetic lenses, which I introduced to you, are actually very, very poor lenses. Yeah. Uh, we like, as electron microscopists, we like to use a very simple comparison. We say, if you take a light microscope, the glass lenses, as I told you, they are so perfect that they are really not the limiting factor. If we look at this magnetic lens, uh, it's actually now here is a, drawn a very perfect shape, but in reality, actually, the, the comparison with a light microscope would be you take a bottle of champagne, you know the bottle of champagne has this curved bottom, you knock off this, uh, this curved glass bottom of a bottle of champagne and you try to use this as a lens. So then you have about the quality of the lenses we use in the electron microscope. Now, we want to describe this in a little bit more physical terms. And in physical terms, we call these poor lenses or the defects which cause the poor performance, we call them aberrations, yeah? And there are two main aberrations, and this is the first one, this is the spherical aberration. So what, what it means is, let's say we have an object here, an image point in an object, maybe an atomic column, which we want to image in the image plane here, but then you see our magnetic lenses are poor, and what happens actually is if we go close to the center in this lens, we can still bring the electrons to a very good focus. But to see the atomic structures, we need electrons which as well, which are scattered to larger angles. And you see here we're drawing the lens like a glass lens and spherical aberration actually also exists in glass lenses. But in reality, in the electron microscope, we have these magnetic lenses. And these electrons, which travel far from the optical axis, they just get closer and closer to these pole pieces where the magnetic field gets stronger and stronger, it gets too strong. And that's why they are over-focused, they are brought to a focus here and they blur our image. Actually, we look at the image in this plane, but uh, we still don't have enough resolution to really see the atomic structures very well. And now the experts may know, and I don't want to go into all these details, uh, the imaging of atomic structure is actually a coherent imaging so we also have to look at the phases of the electron waves and we actually shift these phases of the electron waves. And the problem is that, let's say, if we want to, this is a model structure, if we want to resolve this model structure with such a lens, we actually cannot see the atoms. And all we get is an intensity distribution, interference of waves, where we see bright spots in the image. These bright spots actually have the right periodicity, they have the right symmetry, 
But if you compare what we see here with this model, you see the bright intensity is actually in between the atomic columns where we have vacuum and the atoms where the location where the atoms are, they are in the dark, okay? And for a long time, this was a puzzle in electron microscopy. This was a problem. And people tried to develop computer techniques where you also simulate the image and so on to overcome this barrier, but not a very good idea. So what can we do about this aberration? So now I'm really coming to the next part of my lecture. And this is now the most modern development in electron microscopy. This is correcting these aberrations. And uh, uh, where it happened initially is actually at the research center Jülich. So Alexei mentioned the research center Jülich, uh, which is close to Aachen. And uh, we teamed up with the research center Jülich. This is my colleague, Knut Oban. And in the year 2004, you have maybe seen this in my bio, we founded the Astruska Center for Microscopy and Spectroscopy with Electrons. Uh, Knut Oban retired. Now his uh, successor is Professor Rafael Dunin-Borkowski, my colleague at Jülich. Maybe you have heard about him or know, or know him, yeah? And we choose the name of Ernst Ruska and we had an agreement with his family as well that we are allowed to use the name for our new center. So what's special at the Ernst Ruska Center? Now the idea is if these aberrations limit uh, the resolution, then we want to be able to correct them. So let me talk briefly about aberration correction. Uh, here you see a lens. And this could be an optical lens as well. And actually optical lenses also have this prop uh, property of spherical aberration. But what do you do in an optical microscope? And there may be some experts who know this very well. Uh, this is a focusing lens with a spherical aberration. And you simply correct this with a defocusing lens. So here you have a positive spherical aberration. Here you have a negative spherical aberration. In total, it's zero and you get a sharp. Actually, why do we have spherical aberrations for optical lenses? We can make them absolutely perfect, no problem. But then the shape is a very complex shape, mathematically described by Bessel functions and so on. So in production, it's much simpler to grind this like a sphere. And that's why it's actually called spherical aberration. If you grind this like a sphere, then you have spherical aberration. But now you use the defocusing lens, you also grind this like a sphere and you make the, the same error in the opposite direction and in total it cancels. So very simple principle in light optics. Now unfortunately, and this has already been known to, to Ruska and it's also called the Scherzer theorem because Scherzer really developed the theoretical background for this. All the lenses in electron microscope are these blue lenses and the yellow lenses do not exist. And this was a general paradigm which was believed to be true for decades until three of my colleagues teamed up, Harald Rose from Darmstadt, Max Heider from Heidelberg, and my colleague Knut Oban, and they invented and built an aberration corrector. And the first aberration corrected instrument was actually installed in Knut Oban's lab at the Research Center Jülich, Forschungszentrum Jülich, and this is where the whole field actually started. Now, what, uh, how do we build an aberration corrector? Again, I could talk about this for hours. Let me just briefly summarize. The idea is these optical lenses, they're actually round lenses. So they have round symmetry, yeah? And we can build focusing lenses with round symmetry, but we cannot build these defocusing lenses. And everybody thought, that's it. No way that we can solve this until Harald Rose, he was the theoretical guy. He came up with the solution. If round symmetry doesn't do the job, we use hexapole lenses. We use multipole lenses. And actually by combining two hexapoles, and here you see these uh, multipole lenses, you can build a corrector and these two yellow elements are exactly the equivalent to the defocusing lens in light optics. And it worked, yeah, and here are, now results uh, from the first uh, aberration correcting instruments. Actually that's, you see, this is still a theoretical prediction. This is the structure model. Without corrector, we just see intensity in the dark. The atoms remain in the dark. We see intensity in the vacuum chamber. But now we correct the image. And now you see, you see all the atoms one by one. 
So this is strontium titanate and oxide. So here you see strontium. These are the strontium ions. Between two strontium ions, we have the titanium. So between two strontium ions, you have titanium. Between two titanium ions, we have the oxygen column. And you see every atom singly resolved. And now you could see, for example, if an atomic column is missing, if it shifted or partially occupied, everything would be in the dark. And now with the aberration correctors, you can see. So actually, this is just a theoretical reaction, prediction that it works in reality. This was uh, acquired an image now. It's actually barium titan, pythonate, same structure, on this very first microscope. And you see these defects. Again, twin boundaries. Twin boundaries, like what I've showed you for the gold nanoparticle. So this is a twin boundary where actually you have a mirror symmetry of the orientations across this boundary. If we pick one of these boundaries, then we can analyze the images and the atomic structures in very much detail. We can uh, come up with the atomic structure model. We can come up with the occupancies of the atoms. And I don't want to go into all these details. Uh, time is running. So this was the first result. But now people wanted to get better resolution, better instruments. And uh, it was realized by industry that this is very important. And then the first uh, commercial instruments came up. Uh, this was mainly the company FEI. FEI is actually FEI is an American company, but they bought Philips Electron Optics and all the instruments are still made at Eindhoven Philips Electron Optics. And I know there is a couple of these titans also in, in Russia. There is certainly one or, or even several at Moscow. And uh, the advantage is their operation corrected and they can drop the resolution below one angstrom. So we see now we can get information in the sub angstrom way. Let me just show you one example. It's already quite a complex ceramic material, silicon nitride. And uh, we have distances between the silicon and the nitrogen columns in this projection in which we look at this material of 0 0.85 angstrom. And you see, we can resolve all these distances uh, beautifully in this instrument. And this was a major breakthrough also for material science. Now we can analyze these very complex structures. But the spherical aberration is only one aberration. And actually aberration correctors are now distributed all around the world. So this is the same slide again. So now at the moment there are about 800 correctors for the uh, spherical aberration installed on the world. So there are many laboratories where you can do these cool experiments now and look at these atomic structures. But I mentioned there is a second aberration. And this is actually the chromatic aberration. This is the one which ultimately limits the resolution. This is the one which uh, brings about the resolution limit uh, for the expert knows because chromatic aberration is an incoherent limit. So we cannot help with simulation or other routines uh, to improve the resolution. This ultimately limits. Now the, to correct the chromatic aberration is even more difficult than to correct uh, for the spherical aberration. So actually there are only three correctors for aber chromatic aberration installed in the world. The first one uh, was uh, installed at the National Center for Electron Microscopy at Berkeley uh, in the US. Now the second one is our PICO instrument and I want to show you details of the PICO instrument. And the third one is one specifically for low voltage application at the University of in, uh, in Germany. So just to introduce you to the subject, I don't want to go into very formal grounds. Let me show you a little movie. Actually, I have to switch the pointer. Uh, I have to switch the pointer. No, sorry. Uh, to, so that I can start this. Uh, now I can start the movie. And uh, in this movie, we look inside the TMs and we start first start with a conventional TM, no aberration corrector. The aberrations are still there. So we try to image the atomic structure of this material. We have the objective lens with these aberrations. You see the blurring by the spherical aberration and you see the atoms are in the dark. So the intensity is in between. So we need a corrector for the spherical aberration. These two hexapoles. And now if we look at the sample, if we try to image 
For example, we look at a single atomic column in our sample. First, we have the objective lens, we have the blurring by the uh, spherical aberration, but then we have these two hexapoles. We bring all the electrons back to a sharp focus, and now we see the atoms where they should be. But we still miss some resolution, and that's because of the chromatic aberration. So now we add an even more complex corrector, which you can see here. And now despite the fact that the electrons had slightly different energies, which we uh, indicate here by colors, you see here, we have the electrons, they have different energies, so additional blurring, but now we have this even more complex correctors, 10 multipoles actually. And now we get the ultimate resolution of our sample down to about half an angstrom, as I will show you. Now, these instruments are so sensitive against environmental disturbances that we put them in a big box, we close the box, and the operator has to sit outside to do remote control. So this is our PICO instrument. Uh, let me switch back the pointer. I think it's easier to see for you. This is our PICO instrument in the box. This would be without chromatic aberration projection. These are the results which we can get with a, 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 a chromatic aberration projection. So you see the big gain. Uh, if we look inside again, I just want to show you the complexity, the arrangement of multipoles without going into very much details. Um, I told you spherical aberration, we have two hexapoles. Now we actually have 10 multipole lenses in two groups with five multipole lenses, very special elements here in the center, just to show you the beam pass, which the electrons have to go through these correction elements. And you can understand that there is a really high complexity and so I'm sorry, not enough time to explain all these details. So this is the corrector in, uh, as it was built now at Heidelberg, then installed first in a test column and then uh, later on in our PICO instrument. So if we can correct aberrations, one of the big advantages is that we can also go to lower accelerating voltages. So the examples which I showed you before, metals, transistors, silicon, uh, uh, ceramics, barium titanite, silicon nitride, these materials are not very radiation sensitive. But here we see an example of graphene. Graphene, you know, is a single membrane, a single atomic layer of carbon atoms. And if the electrons come with their full energy, they just knock out the carbon atoms and the sample will be gone within seconds. So we go to lower accelerating voltages, the electrons are slower, they cannot knock out the atoms anymore. And then we can image these materials. We know actually that the threshold for damage for graphene is about 80 kilovolt. So here we go down actually to 50 kilovolt. And here we see a perfect area of the graphene. And here you see the high resolution image. And you see these bright spots, they're individual single carbon atoms which are linked to the graphene network and graphene membrane. And I guess you're all familiar with graphene. So here we have a special application actually where we etch nanopores into the graphene. And nanopores is something where, for example, uh, uh, molecular biologists are very exciting about because they can use these nanopores for nanofiltration and they can even do gene sequences and other fancy stuff if they have these nanopores. How do we build these nanopores? We actually put a few palladium atoms, few palladium atoms on this membrane. And you see these palladium atoms etch away the carbon atoms and they walk along the edge of this hole here and make the hole larger and larger. And you see, we can see single palladium atoms here. And so the message is our new microscopes, in particular the PICO, they're really so good that we cannot only see atomic structures in a crystal or in a thin specimen, but we can even image single atoms, very single atoms, palladium actually here, it's single carbon atoms. And we can do that even at these low voltages with a resolution of better than one angstrom. And if we go to higher voltages with the PICO, we reach half an angstrom resolution. Actually, um, because we have 
a modified newer version of the CC corrector, which is better, for example, than the Berkeley one. Uh, we believe that PICO is the best electron microscope in the world. So just another application, this is a very modern technique now. Uh, we can image atomic scale processes in C2. Actually, again, I have to switch back to the uh, pointer. So then I can start the movie. Here we have a nanoparticle, a catalytic nanoparticle, rhodium, in an ionic liquid. And you see there is a defect in this nanoparticle. The upper half is different from the lower half. Now, nature doesn't like this. The thermal equilibrium is a faceted nanoparticle. And as we do this in situ experiment, you can see how this defect actually anneals out. Now, actually, we have to make sure that this is not the impact of the electrons. That's why we also go to lower accelerating voltage instead of 300,000, which is maximum on the PICO. We only use 80 kilovolts. Um, and you see, actually, all this flickering. This is really the elementary motion of the molecules and atoms. This is the Brownian motion in nature. So we can even resolve the Brownian nature, a Brownian movement. And you can see this particle gets better and better. And uh, there's still some fluctuation. But in the end of the movie, you see that uh, this defect, which was in the center, has completely annealed out. And we have a perfectly faceted nanoparticle with perfect crystal structure. So in C2, and I could show more movies of in C2 and so on, it's becoming a more and more important technique. But, and I'm, I noticed that time is running, sorry, I'm so fascinating uh, to explain these things in a little bit more detail. Uh, so I want to come to some applications of our technique in material science. And in particular, some quite uh, modern and novel applications and uh, uh, you know that there are many areas in technology where we want to advance. Let me switch back to the pointer. Where we advance the technology, but if you think about it, materials are always at the core of these developments. Materials are really the technology drivers, the technology enablers uh, for renewable energies, for information technology, and maybe also for, you know, for organic materials and to understand uh, living matter, yeah? Materials are always at the core and the characterization of materials is always the starting point for future development of these uh, materials. I want to show you some example, actually sort of uh, over different categories from our work. And the first example is actually from the development of new steels. Think about car application, for example. Car industry is very important in Germany, but uh, you want to get better and better steels. Now, the problem with steels is that you can either make them very hard, very hard. The harder they are, you can work lightweight. You can make a, a, a car, for example, more lightweight if you have steel with higher hardness. But the problem is, then you cannot deform them anymore. If you want to make them ductile so that they can uh, uh, deform much better, for example, to make such a car uh, uh, body, yeah, then actually ductility goes at the expense of hardness. So if you reduce the hardness, you get more ductility. If you increase the hardness, you get less ductility. And I don't know the people who are in the steel field, maybe there are some in the audience, they know. Uh, this uh, curve is called the banana, or this curve, this diagram is called the banana diagram, yeah? So obviously the target is, can we develop steels which get harder and still more ductile at the same time? So can we go in this direction? And there are new concepts, and for example, austenitic or aging steels, but they are actually very expensive steels. And so we are involved in a development where we actually develop steels up here, which are not very expensive and which really have huge potential of being hard, but still deformable. And so the question is, what is happening? Why are these steels so special? And uh, the answer, and we are involved with the microscopy, is actually 
because these steels show atomic transformation when they are deformed. And uh, it's uh, these acronyms, maybe you've heard about them. This is transformation in TRIP, is transformation induced plasticity. And TWIP, and I want to uh, focus on TWIP, is actually twinning induced plasticity. So again, we see the twins, remember from the gold nanoparticle, remember from barbarium titanate. Now we use these twins in the steel to make them better. And actually here you can see the twinning, and here you can see a crash box application of such a steel. So while we do this crash test, so this is one of the crash box element, while we do this uh, crash experiment, uh, I think this is a very cool video, in the deformation actually oh. we form these trips. And oh. uh, when we do these trips, hello now somebody, yeah now it's better. And when we do these twins, the material gets harder and harder and absorbs more and more energy. So you know, the experts know in the crash, uh, in the car crash for example, you have to absorb the mechanical energy and the energy absorption is actually given by the area under the curve. And here you see a hundred percent strain while at the same time a hardness which goes uh, uh, to several hundred megapascals. So this is quite exceptional. This is what brings us in the banana diagram along this diagonal. So now we understand, want to understand in more detail and maybe even on a theoretical basis what happens in this material. We have to characterize the material across all length scales. So it doesn't only help if we know the atomic structure. We also know, have to know what happens macroscopically in the material. And uh, for example, what we do here is we have uh, a scanning electron microscope with a very large chamber. And in this scanning electron microscope, we then can do in situ tests, in situ deformation. And this is now again, oh sorry, I have to start the movie. So let me go back to this. So let's start this movie. So we deform, we deform a, a, a piece of the steel by bending it, by bending it, yeah? And we look at the upper surface and we see the defects which form while we bend it. And now the bending starts and you see we form planar defects. So the answer for the secret of these materials must lie in these planar defects. And you see how they shoot out uh, if we advance the testing. Here is an analysis. Uh, again, I play the same movie. Uh, we have the planar defects which form. Uh, here is an analysis of the strain field. You see, in me, we first form a strain field, and when the strain has started, then this planar defect shoot in, and you have negative strain on one side, positive on the other side, and this causes the formation of these planar defects. Uh, let me just play this again, and you see how these defects kick in, and what, what do this material look like? we have to look, uh, all these defects, we have to look at larger magnification. Now this is a TM image, not atomic resolution, I'll show you atomic resolution later, but uh, here you can see, uh, I think now I can go back to the pointer. Here you can see these planar defects which kick in, which we have seen macroscopically from the outside. Here you see it in the TM image. And what are these defects? They're twin boundaries. So twin lamella, twin lamella. So uh, we can zoom in a little bit higher magnification and you see uh, when more and more of these twins form, we get a finer and finer structure in the materials. Now steel people know that uh, this makes the steel harder because this forms obstacles against deformation, against dislocation movement. And uh, we can actually call this, if we make microstructure finer and finer, we call the effect the whole patch effect and the material gets small, uh, 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 harder and harder. And this is a dynamical whole patch effect because initially the material is soft, so we can easily bend it if we form a car body, for example, yeah, part of a car body. We can easily bend it, but then when you start bending, these defects can kick in and it gets harder and harder. And in the end, it's so hard that the car 
is really in the perfect condition, perfect shape, and also perfect properties in terms of hardness and crash and so on. So now let's look at the atomic structure. So now we go to one of our titans. This is one of the titans actually. And we see the atomic structure. And again, you see the mirror boundary, uh, which forms the twins. We zoom in. And this is now a theoretical model of a twin boundary. We look at the real high resolution image. And you see the theoretical model has a perfect mirror symmetry. The real twin boundary, which we observe in our electron microscope, which lies here, actually does not have this mirror symmetry. Look at this yellow plane, which leads to the twin boundary, but look at the other yellow plane. They don't meet. There is a gap. They don't, they don't uh, uh, have perfect symmetry. And this offset puzzled us for quite a long time. Why, where does it come from? And what is the influence on the properties? And if we analyze this more closely, here we do a high resolution TM simulation just to understand what we see in the image. And you can see by simulation, we can reproduce this very nicely. And the conclusion which we found, and I only want to mention this point, obviously this is part of a very long story. Um, we have a high sensitivity for lattice tilt. So you actually see this asymmetry in the image of the atom. So actually it turns out that there is not only a mirror image as this twin boundary, but there is a slight rotation of the crystals. And this rotation, we were now actually able to translate into simulations. They were done at the Max Planck Institute for Steel Research at Düsseldorf. And this is one major point which I also want to make in my lecture. We can only completely understand what nature does if we have the experimental results, but then if we can do the theoretical simulation as well, because theory tells us exactly what is the physical basis of the phenomena. And so they started the simulation and they actually calculated the twin boundary for different configurations of the atoms. And they also found that the shift can be explained as a state of low, oops, sorry, this is now the next example, as the state of lowest potential energy and the state which brings us the uh, uh, um, highest hardness for these boundaries. And uh, uh, so a very nice example of how we can bring together uh, experiments, atomic resolution experiments with these ab initio calculations, density functional theory of atomic structures. And I really like this example because it steals, you know, mass product and cars and uh, whatever uses steals. And there are details in nature which still are not fully understood and which can help to make uh, these materials better and better. But now let me move on. I want to show you one energy application. We are actually diff active in many different fields. Energy is a big topic in Germany, I guess in, in Russia as well. We're working a lot on batteries, but batteries are very complex uh, systems and materials. So I want to show you here one example from photovoltaics. So photovoltaics, you know, in Germany, almost every second roof, roof is now covered with photovoltaic cells. And um, they're based, they're made out of silicon, actually single crystalline, normally single crystalline, maybe polycrystalline. They're made out of silicon. Now the problem with silicon actually is that the efficiency is very limited. Uh, it's called the shockley quasar limit and it relates actually to the band structure of silicon. So the band structure, physics experts uh, know that uh, silicon a semiconductor, there is a band gap and the band gap in silicon is actually one, the number is 1.1 eV and the band gap is actually a little bit too small to efficiently absorb uh, the solar light. So we can absorb the parts of the visible light with low energy or large wavelengths. We can absorb very efficiently, but shorter wavelengths, higher uh, uh, um, wavelengths can actually not be absorbed very well by these single or polycrystalline silicon cells. So how can we increase the efficiency? This is part of a research project. 
which is funded by the BMBF, the German Ministry of Research and Education. And now actually you see, we have here a multi-layer structure. Physically speaking, this is actually a quantum well structure. This is a quantum well structure. And the quantum wells are actually made out of ultra thin silicon layers. So we are actually using quantum effects to increase the efficiency and the target of the project was 60%, which we didn't reach, but we are at 40% now. And so the quantum size effect actually is if we make a layer thinner and thinner, and we really have to go to the nanometer range, deep nanometer range, if we make silicon thinner and thinner, we go thin, and conversely, the band gap goes up, yeah? So we make the layer thinner, the band gap gets larger. For larger band gaps, we can absorb the high energy components, blue uh, and green light. The low energy components just pass through. So here we have a standard silicon uh, photovoltaic cell. Here we have the multi-quantum weld system. We call this a tandem cell concept and we get really much higher. We double the efficiency, okay. Now, obviously, we work together with our Institute for Semiconductor Technology. They manufacture these cells, but they want to know what is the internal structure. They want us to measure these individual layers. And here you can see just one example, but to get a much better answer, because we have higher resolution, we go to our PICO instrument. Now, actually, here you can see really nothing. The problem is the better your resolution, the finer the details, and you cannot really see it in such an image. So we magnify, then we see the crystalline layers. These are the quantum well layers. They are um, separated by an insulator, otherwise they don't work as a quantum well. And the insulator in this design is simply SiO2. So we have silicon quantum well layers, we have SiO2 in between. We can measure the widths of these layers. Now this is actually the structural width. Okay, structural width. It turns out if you analyze the properties, the chemical width is actually much more important. And so we want to image the chemical distribution of the elements, but we want, would like to get an answer at atomic resolution. Now for chemical mapping, we use electrons with lost energy, but then we have the chromatic aberration, which kills our resolution and we cannot see the atomic structure. But as you learned, we have the PICO electron microscope, and this is really the best electron microscope in the world to do this. We can image one chemical element at atomic resolution, only with chromatic aberration correction. And here you see bright, this is now silicon imaged at atomic resolution. You can see the lattice planes. So this is the quantum well layer, and you see the amorphous material in between. Now, since the amorphous material is SiO2, we also see some structure, but lower intensity. Here, 100% silicon. Here, only 40% silicon in SiO2. So we see both the uh, uh, crystalline quantum layer and the amorphous oxide in between at atomic resolution. You see here a very narrow layer, only two nanometers. You see elongated grains, which we need because when we produce the current in this photovoltaic cell, we have to transport the current as well. If there are too many grain boundaries, we block the current, high resistance, low efficiency. So this is the final, the ultimate solar cell, which we have produced. You also see diffuse boundaries, and that's why we need the chemical mapping. Structurally, they are much sharper, chemically they are diffuse. This diffuseness actually is a good thing, because again, if you are in the field, you know, that the efficiency is killed by the recombination of the charge barriers at these interfaces. If they are diffuse, there are no recombination centers and the current can flow without the danger of recombination. And so this is the final result. Okay, I know this time is running. Maybe if you give me a, a couple of more minutes, I want to show you one last example. This is now, and you see how many fields we can cover if we have this very special microscope. This is uh, from the area of information technology. And uh, this is, um, as a matter of introduction, you know, information technology 
the wafers get larger and larger and the structures get smaller and smaller. This is Moore's law. But people know that Moore's law will soon get to an end. And uh, one of the problems is that Moore's law and the classical silicon-based device concepts, for example, they are based on perfection. So throughout such a 30 centimeter wafer, everything has to be perfect from this corner to this corner. But then if, if everything is so perfect, we also have a physical limit to the miniaturization. So can we overcome this uh, uh, limit if we look at defects? And this is uh, part of uh, a project where we look at future IT systems, non-volatile memories in particular, but we also want to work on non von Neumann computer architectures. And ultimately, can we mimic the way in which a brain, a human brain, uh, uh, deals with information, uh, um, handles information? We know a human brain is much more efficient than a computer. You need a big computer which fills this whole room to get the functionality of a human brain. And the way we want to do this, there are several different approaches and uh, as time is moving on, I don't want to cover onto all these approaches. Many of them are based on memristic phenomena. So what are memristic phenomena? This is uh, in the core of the project which we're working on. And here we summarize this change of paradigm. So now, we actually don't have a perfect transistor, for example, which I showed you before, but we have a tiny little defect in the material. And in this tiny little defect, the properties are different and we can switch the properties. And so we can process information in areas which have the size of only a few atoms or maybe a few nanometers, but much smaller than what we conventionally have. And this is uh, what we investigate and there are different mechanisms. We look at phase change, we look at thermochemical. Actually today, I only want to talk about the valence change mechanism, which is also the most advanced one in this field of uh, non-volatile memory and which happens. Valence means, uh, for example, we have an oxygen and uh, sorry, we have an oxide and we change the valency of the cations in this oxygen. So this is phase change. Uh, this is, uh, and you see here, for example, an amorphous bit, and you see how the phase changes. This is an in situ experiment. We can erase this bit. And then we use a laser or an electric pulse and write it again. Don't want to cover this. I only want to talk about valence change. Here you can see a diagram and of a valence change material. And I want to explain uh, the details, more of the details. So, what is the basic, sorry, I'm talking and talking, but I think this is interesting, so maybe I can cover this. What is the basic idea with these new uh, memories, with these new devices? And that, why do we believe that Moore's law is soon coming to an end? So now I'm talking to IT interested people, but maybe it's uh, interest to all of you. Remember Moore's law for 50 years predicted the feature size of transistors, the number of transistors on a chip. But here this is for example Moore's law of storage technology. And for 50 years Moore's law predicted the development of the feature size of storage technology very well. But then Moore's law would also predict in the year 2030 a memory chip is, has the size of an atom. And obviously this cannot happen. So at some point uh, Moore's law must uh, come to an end. And actually we think we are here that we already see that these curves deviate from Moore's law. Why is this the case? Because the memories which we use at the moment, this is for example DRAM in the central CPU or flash, USB sticks and so on, they are based on electrons. So what we want to do is we want to confine electrons in this storage cell and uh, we want to keep them in a, in a volume which is smaller and smaller and smaller. So to keep the electron here, for example, this is the information of bit one, we need barriers around the electron. We need an energy barrier. And uh, now as we make these barriers smaller and smaller, then actually we get quantum effects like before, and the quantum effect in this case is 
the electron can actually tunnel through the band. So now the tunneling probability is given in, in, in the most fundamental way in physics by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is one way to write Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And this contains the frequency, the frequency with which the electron wants to, tries to tunnel here, 10 to the 13 times per second. Now we want to make sure that the information is stable for 10 years. So this is the, we call this the retention time, 10 years despite 10 to the 13 attempts per second. And the only way we can realize this is we need a high energy barrier. So the energy barrier is given by the oxides which we use, uh, oxide barriers, silicon dioxide, alumina. This is around 3 eV. But then we uh, so this is the energy barrier, and then the mass is important of our tunneling entity. Now, unfortunately, electrons have a very small mass and even an effective mass in these chips, which is smaller than one. And so you can see that the minimum dimensions to avoid this tunneling, minimum dimension, remember Moore's law, minimum dimension are of the order of five to six nanometer for this width. And this is where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle we cannot beat. So this is the end of semiconductor development storage technology. Uh, this is the end in physics. This is where Moore's law here will end and a little bit more higher probably because of the dimensions. So how can we get to smaller devices? And the answer is if we do not use electrons, if we use atoms to store the information. They are much, much heavier. Their mass is much, much higher. So we divide by a high, much, much higher mass here. So we can go to very small dimension. So in principle, a memory device could be a dimension of less than a nanometer, half a nanometer. How can we realize this? And the, so the central idea is employ atomic configurations to realize these large storage densities. And so we are looking at model systems. This valence change mechanism, which I want to introduce to you, actually happens. Uh, the best materials are oxides. And now we want to confine this to defects. So we said we look at the function of defects. And the most simple defect in an oxide line defect, so we can store the information along a, a line, is a dislocation. So we prepare an artificial array of dislocations. We do this actually by uh, bonding two crystals with a slight mist tilt, more like this. And you see, we form a small angle grain boundary if we do this. And in the small angle grain boundary, we have a regular array of dislocations. And we want to look at the properties of this dislocation. So here is a high resolution image. Actually, in this case, it's acquired in the scanning mode, high resolution stem. We see the dislocation core and the dislocation core is actually where these things happen. So we analyze the dislocation core. We do the mapping of you know, strontium titanate. We map strontium, we map titanium. This is the combined image. Here we have an atomic structure image. We combine chemistry, which we have here with atomic structure here. We get this image. And now you see atomic structure, but again, the chemical coding of the different elements. Red is strontium, green is titanium. Now, if you look in the dislocation core, so this is the dislocation core. This is where the dislocation is. And at the lower side, there is more green than red. So there is a titanium enrichment at the lower side. And this is what caught our attention. This is what causes the special functions. And if we look at uh, the dislocation core here and we analyze the structure, we see there is actually, and I'm cutting this a little bit short, there's actually a titanium oxide. And this is, has the FCC structure because we're in a cubic material. And in this FCC structure, titanium lowers its valency. And this lowering of the valency is what we use for the valence change storage. And we can analyze this also by doing the spectroscopy. So here we map the bonding state of titanium. So we cannot only see the chemical distribution, but we can also see the bonding state. And here you see bonding state titanium four plus, but in the 
lower region of the dislocation core, we can see the valency is reduced. So this is titanium two plus, titanium three plus. And likewise, we can see that the oxygen changes the vacancy. So here we have a different material, and this is the defect which we use for switching. Now, can we use this? This is one of the challenges which we address to build devices which actually behave like a human brain, neuromorphic computer. And so we see here the switching of a synapse, and we actually know that we can reproduce, a brain can reproduce multiple levels, not just one level, you know, classical computer, bit zero, bit one, lot of space to realize this. If we have multiple levels in one element, in one synapse, everything can get much more compact. And this is what we see uh, in our devices. And uh, uh, this is actually what we can realize uh, in these uh, new uh, computers. Uh, so this is the cell which helps us to switch and to realize these functions. Um, I could talk a lot more about uh, these details uh, and what we can analyze, but uh, I think uh, yeah, I've used up all my time so this is really the last slide and thank you very much for your attention.